Hello, this is the Leaders World brought to you by Leaders World Institute. And today is a special day. We have guests in the house already. All our guests are here and we are talking women, leadership and success. Women's History Month will not end without us concluding on this conversation. And that's why today with me, in the studio, we have two amazing personalities. We have Professor Joyce Ashul Ntang is here with us. She is a passionate educator and thought leader with vast international experience. She is a poet, actress, interdisciplinary scholar, and professor of English at the University of Hartford, Connecticut. She is a graduate of schools from three continents, from Africa, Europe, and North America. She is an author of many scholarly and creative publications, including her poetry collection, Beautiful Fire, that won the 2020 African Literature Association Book of the Year, award for creative writing for more than with more than 35 years experience professor joyce has been invited as poet in many countries around the world including england germany nicaragua greece costa rica colombia bangladesh cameroon and the united states her poems have been translated into seven other languages her awards include the Spirit of Detroit Award for Leadership, Ministry of Culture Cameroon, Award for Outstanding Performance in Theater, Bell K. Ribikoff Prize for Excellence in Teaching and Scholarship, Ivory Club Pan-African Educator Award, and Kafak Bangladesh Literary Award. Ladies and gentlemen, I could say much more, but I know you want to meet her, Professor Joyce. You're thank welcome. you so much, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. That's humbling. We are so excited to have you. We are so excited to have you. Um, I was speaking with, with um, the president for Leaders World Institute, and he was like, are you bringing Professor Joyce <laughs> on the <this> show? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> I say, yes, we are <laughs> doing this. All right. And we have with us uh, Rashida Jordan. I told her, I have been your secret admirer for a long time. And today we have her. She is speaker, certified coach, mentor, author, actor, and encourager. She is the creator of Who Shall Encourage the Encourager. She is president of Jordan a Group LLC. She is the founder of Joy Multiplied Incorporated. Her mentorship program, Treasure, helps young women build self-esteem, self image and their faith in God. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in pre-medicine psychology from the University of Illinois. She has over 25 years of corporate experience in roles, including HR employee relations, corporate training, sales, customer service. She has equipped thousands of leaders, coaches, business owners, and personal uh, clients nationally and internationally. Rashida's work has been featured in commercials, in print arts, in, in print ads, in, in industrials and film projects. And in 2017, Rashida received the prestigious John Maxwell Culture Award for leading and lifting others by the world-renowned expert, John C. Maxwell. She lives in Dallas, Texas with her husband and business partner, Yonel, and their two sons, Jonathan and Christopher. I could say much more, but I know he want to meet her. <laughs> and with us, this moment, we have Rashida Jordan. Good nice morning. meeting you here, Rashida. <laughs> oh, pleasure to meet you, Professor Joyce and Susan and Bishop. It's a it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. You know, Susan, when you were reading that, I was like, man, who is that person she's talking about? And <laughs> you mentioned being a secret admirer, but I am an admirer of you, your ministry, 
your business, who you are as a person, your character, your husband, your marriage. And I just pray blessings upon blessings, not only for the women who are watching today, this broadcast, but that God would enlarge your territory. I pray Ephesians. Amen. Blessings on you in Jesus name. So thank you for having me. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rashida. Thank you, Professor Joyce. And we are here to talk women and leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, if you've not shared this, you want to share it. Um, one of our uh, viewers wrote back to me after the last session and said, hey, you were talking to women, but guess what? I watched everything and you were talking to me. And I wrote back to him and I said, leadership principles transcend gender, geography, and all barriers. So this is for everybody. Make sure you share this with everyone and we will be right back. For your corporate and personal needs, Leaders World Institute, changing lives, one leader at a time. Well, my question right now is, should we really be having this conversation? Why am I asking this question? I have been working with women for more than 18 years. I even worked as a... Um, um, an administrative staff with the Minister of Women's Empowerment and the family in Cameroon as well. Um, one time when I was just starting my work with women around 2004, I met this woman. Uh, she was a leader in somewhere. And I was talking with her about this women's stuff I was doing. And then she told me, you know what? There is no such thing as women's ministry. It, it's just ministry. And I was like, Hmm. Interesting perspective. Professor Joyce, should we be having this conversation, women, leadership and success? Yes, yes, yes. And yes. And um, one of the things about womanhood, especially African womanhood, is that we grow up, we grow up doing a lot of things, you know, but we are not intentional about it. <clears throat> Intentionality is the, is the key word here, that now we are setting out to do it as a goal. My mother was a leader without knowing she's a leader, you know, and, and, and that, that is why we have to talk about it if we have to, to uh, get specific results. So we have to, yes, so the short answer is yes, because we have to be intentional about it. Wow, thank you so much. Intentionality is key here because we are now targeting specific results. It's not about going about everything and not understanding what we are doing. What we we want to be intentional about it. Rashida, should we be having this conversation? Absolutely, yes, all day, every day. Because as Dr. Joy said, we not only need to be intentional about it, women have different strengths. They have the ability to enhance anything that they're given. I think sometimes when we step back, we don't realize that all sheroes are not wearing a cape. They're not always in the public eye. And so when we have these conversations, whether it's in women's ministry, women's organizations, women groups, what we're doing is collectively recognizing our values together as women. I think about um, just even when God created man and woman, he blessed them together before he even created and formed. And women have the ability to touch and enhance and enlarge anything that they're giving. You think about it. I mean, if you give me groceries, I'll give you a meal, right? I'll make you a meal. You give me a house, I'll give you a home. Women have the ability that if you if you give us seed, we'll give you children. And so when we have this conversation, what it is doing is remembering and is celebrating who we are. I do the woman, I do understand her saying there is only ministry. That's not always the case. There are specific needs that need to be catered to specific groups. And women and girls, we need to have the conversation every day, all day, and not just to women. The conversation should also involve our men as well. Oh, and, wow. And, and as, uh, Susan, if I, if I may add there, when that woman said there's no women's ministry, uh, it's a symptom. 
of a, of a problem when you are coming from behind, because there's this need of wanting a kind of equality, you know? So if you say I'm an African woman, uh, no, you are African, you're not African woman. If you say I am black, no, you're not black. You're, you're a human being, you're not black. You know, uh, some people are afraid of those labels because they think that it reduces them. You know, because it's like if I say women's ministry, then I'm saying I'm less, you know, but what they don't realize is that universality may sound like a good place to be, but it's a vague place to be. It is vague to be universal. You have to be specific. You have to be grounded in something in order for you to be concrete. So I I can see myself. Woman is not good enough. Black is black woman is not good enough. A Bayangi black woman from Ashum village is even better because it because it gives me specifics to latch onto. It gives me value systems to ground me. But unfortunately, as a minority, it's very easy to go to that clock of universality. That's why some people will tell you, "I don't see color. That I don't see gender." You don't see color, you don't see gender. What do you see? You see a, a blob? What do you see? You freaking got to say something. Okay. Okay. Pro, pro, pro has taken us to every place we want to go right now. She has. And, and she said, universality is a vague place to be. And she says, in order to be grounded, there must be specifics. And that is why we are having this conversation. And Rashida told us that women have the strength and ability to enhance. And everything that we touch, we are able to enlarge. And now collectively, we are looking at our values and how to uh, make better everything we are doing. Um, uh, Rashida, what, do you what is your view on women's contributions into this world? Oh, our contributions into this world, um, just even in the last century and, and beyond have exploded. But let me just back up because I always go back to the point of origin. I mean, as a, a believing the word of God in the creation, he said, God said when he created man and gave him reign and rule, he blessed both of them. He made two models, male and female. OK, but he said it is not good for man to live alone. And usually in the church, we only identify that in the context of marriage. But think about what our sovereign, wise God said. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make unto him a help me to help her. Yes, we're talking about a wife. Absolutely. But he was meaning that he was going to give him the portion of himself. Remember, we're made in his image that will, will add and increase everything like I referred to. So when we look at the contributions of women, it started from the origin of man and woman and creation. And then down through the centuries and years, every, every man has gotten here through a woman. If you show me a man that hasn't gotten here through a woman, then I would just say maybe he's an alien or something. I don't, I don't know any men that haven't gotten here through the contribution of a woman. So our contribution, whether we are in front being recognized or whether we're behind the scenes are tremendous. And just in, in the last century alone, in the areas of medicine and government and politics and arts and um, the police. I have a best friend who's who's um, a police officer following after her father's footsteps. The military, we talk about doctors and we talk about people in science who are women, their contribution, we would not be where we are today. Not only without the women who are visibly in the position of leadership that we can assign a name to, but we wouldn't be here without the contribution of women who are hidden, who are behind the scenes, the mothers and the caretakers. Behind every good man, there is a woman from his mother to his auntie, to his sister, to his grandmother. Behind every good woman, her contribution is another woman. And so what I believe with our contributions today, they are seen and then they also are hidden, but collectively they are, um, unequivocally without our imprint on everything, whether it's technology, down to science, down to music. We are in everything and our contribution has not only been great, it's about to exponentially be beyond our explanation in the day, in the weeks and years and months to come. I believe that. 
you know, I, I like, I, Rashidia, thank you so much. I like how you said that in our previous, um, uh, you know, in our previous uh, broadcast, we had um, our guests who told us that um, she, she's she's professor at the university. She said recently um, they discovered that there are so many girls graduating from universities mm -hmm. and she was even shocked that at the university where she was um, officiating at the graduation ceremony, there were more girls that were graduating than boys. And she was explaining to us that the, the it's, it's shifting, that there is a lot that's shifting right now. Uh, I don't know if uh, what Professor Joyce would say about that. And one thing that she told us as well is that uh, she said that women, we have so much, but somehow we limit ourselves. We limit ourselves. And then she spoke about how her male colleagues, they easily come and ask for raises. Meanwhile, they are not as qualified. Some of them are not as qualified, but she sees some female colleagues that are very qualified, but they don't even think about asking for a raise. So I am looking and wondering, do women really have a limitation, Professor Joyce? Um, before I get to that, I would like to talk about the country women's contribution oh, because definitely. it's very um, easy when we talk about contributions to look at the professions, you know, yeah. and women have done a lot. They've gone to the moon, they've uh, doctors and stuff, but where women contribute the most any day, all time, uh, it's what Rashida mentioned also as caregivers. Yes. Women are the primary caregivers in every country in the world, taking care of children, elderly, and when the universe goes through any cataclysmic change, women are there to adjust the rest of the world. We just went through the pandemic. Take women out of the equation, we would have had many more dead. And all through history, whether it's in world wars, whether it's in pandemics, it is the women who hold it together. It is the women as the base of the family unit. That is their contribution to this world that we live. Take them out of the world, we would all be dead. Okay. We would all be dead. So the women's contribution is holding the fabric together. Okay. When we go through a new thing, the COVID came, we don't know what it is, and we all immediately women start adjusting without even knowing what the science is, what it is. They start going back to their grandmothers, what they did. They're doing this remedy here. They're doing this remedy here. They, be, they, they fill spaces without anybody giving them the lead. <laughs> it is the women who took charge in the homes. That is women's contribution. And it happens every day, anytime. And why is it that they don't have that, uh, um, that know how to go negotiate. It is socialization. Mm, mm, it is socialization. Mm. It is what we have inculcated. You don't want to be pushful. You don't want to, to, to appear ambitious. You, you know, so some of those boss words that we are supposed to be uh, prim and proper and nice. Niceness is part of a woman's makeup. Niceness is not part of a man's makeup. You know, one of my favorite quotes is um, uh, this quote that uh, good women don't make history. Until we know that you're supposed to be bad. Until women know that what is good for them, it's supposed to be ambitious. You're supposed to be goal oriented. We would not ask for those uh, peers. We would not. Mm. So it, it's socialization, um, so, socialization and um Rashida, how and also awareness, awareness, which is why uh, conversations yeah. like this are good because yeah. some women may not even know that that is possible yeah. in this day and age. Who mm. would believe that in, in this century women are still being paid less? Oh, yeah, oh, Who yeah, would believe that. Okay, the first step to solving any problem is the awareness. The awareness, Rash Rash Rashida. Can you tell us a little bit more about the awareness that we we might need as women to um, 
cross boundaries and, and go to the next levels of our dreams and what we actually want to be as women in our communities, in our workplaces. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the awareness first, before we um, get it socially, we have to, uh, we have to know our identity. I always go back to identity being the foundation. So for example, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know uh, what value you have and the worth that you have, you won't know to ask for things like raises. You won't know to fight for certain things because you won't feel like or believe that it's your right and that it belongs to you. I think that also um, in the instance of what we can do to fight for our dreams, a lot of times I do agree um, that our social limitations, how we were raised, you know, sometimes you are raised in the the shaping and the imprint of your family. And so you are just carrying on traditions and carrying on rituals and just kind of going on with business as usual without really understanding that you are uniquely made. There is not another woman like you. There will never be another woman like you. Even if you were a twin of another woman, you two are, are different completely different. And so when you know your value and you know your worth, well, where do you get your values from? Most of the time we start and we get them from our families and then we get them socially and then we get them externally. But there has to come a point as a woman that you have to go within and you have to go back to God. Who did you make me to be? If you said that I made in your image first, I need to understand who you are because outside of you, there is no me. I won't be able to project anything other than a hologram, if I'm not rooted in who I am as a woman. And I think that socially, we also look to celebrities and we look on TV and we look at who is celebrated in our worlds. We look at the leaders that have the camera in front of them. But sometimes you got to pull away from all of that and go in your quiet prayer closet and get in your own space and say, let me see who I am. What is it that I contribute? What is it that I believe? You have to create and rewrite rules to go after your goals and dreams. Sometimes you're not, the rule is not written for you. You don't have to be a rule breaker. You don't have to be a hell maker, but sometimes you just have to rewrite the rules so that you can fit in and, and contribute what you were assigned to contribute in the life you were given from the time you're born until the time the Lord calls you home. So knowing who you are, knowing yes. what you want, rewriting your rules, not yes. living somebody else's dream is key to you actually um, living out who you were created to be your purpose. Oh, wow, wow, wow. That was speaker, mentor, coach Rashida telling us, mm -hmm. know your value, know your worth. Sometimes you might need to rewrite the rules. Sometimes you might need to, uh, you need to definitely go back within and, 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 and know who you are as a person. How can women be more assertive, uh, Professor Joyce? How can, how can we be more assertive? Is being assertive positive or negative? I, I, I think we'll, we'll circle back to what Rashida has said is uh, being intentional, but we have to acknowledge that a lot of us are products of insecure leadership from the house. Ooh. A lot of us, a lot of homes, you know, because these homes were going up where we're being projected or framed via different values. For example, in the African household, um, respect of elder was a key. And because of that, children did not have voices. And because you didn't have voices, you were not empowered. I was, I was fortunate that I, I had uh, experience with secure leadership. My father in particular was very secure. As, uh, and I, I don't think he would have termed himself secure. It was his way. He, when I was, I, I remember when I was, uh, I was 20 years old when he got appointed to a position. And in the manner of Cameroon, he, he believed that he had had that position because a minister had intervened for him. So he wanted to do a thank you letter to that minister. And he came to me, it was a gov government minister. I said, could you do a draft of the letter? And my mother thought he was out of his mind. You're asking this child to, to draft a letter? Yes, letter. I understood what he was doing. He was empowering me. He had realized that I loved literature. I loved writing. It was a way of giving me the nod, you know, 
Of course, I did my my little draft. I don't think that's it. He definitely worked uh, worked on it. But that secure leadership that it empowered me. It gave me it gave me a voice. A lot of us grew up in environments where we are not empowered. So when uh, Rashida says um, rewrite your rules, and that if you are not intentional about it, you can do it. You're not empowered to do that. You're not empowered to think that you can be innovative from the house. You can talk, children are supposed to be seen, not heard. We can ask questions. You, you, you cannot be right. Mm. A parent can tell you sorry. Mm. You, you know, so those are the things. And, and we, we think leadership is out there when somebody is a director of government. No, your mother was a leader. Your father was a leader. And the way you were raised makes you used to certain kinds of leadership. So when you go to a workspace that you're just receiving, that's what you're used to. You don't know that you could be empowered. There's no delegation. Nobody's telling you that do this. Nobody is telling you that you're smart. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a home where my, my uh, older sister can just come and say, I hear you guys are, are smart in this house. Now spell this oval teen. And she'll just be giving us the little words around the house. That empowered us, you know, it means that, okay, we can show off our little notion, we spell sugar, we spell this, we spell that. Honestly, the, it starts from there. And it she was leading and empowering yes. your sister. Yes. And so that is, when I look back, that is what I, I noticed that we, we have, we come with baggage. And that's why I'll keep settling back to intentionality so that you can go back to the drawing board. Yes. To say, Yes. What do I want here? How can I how can I do it? We grew up in societies where we just roll. You just roll. Everything is coming from the outside. Wow. You know, everything is coming from the outside. You are not chatting your agenda. Wow. Thank you so much, Professor. I know you're watching right now. Let us know you're there. Engage with us. Put in the chat. Hashtag intentionality is key. Hashtag intentionality is key. And I'm coming to you, uh, Rashida. How can women be more strategic in owning their own futures? Because there is a time when we can blame others for our circumstances. But hey, don't we grow up? Don't we take responsibility? How can women in every sphere, in every scope of life be more strategic? Because the future is looking really bright for women. And there are opportunities that are opening in every field, in every space. How can we be more strategic in owning those futures? Yeah. You know, when I, when I think of strategy, which the origin of it is a military term. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So when you think of strategy and you're thinking about how to execute a plan or a vision, we like to just kind of jump in and start going through the list of what we need to do. But I, 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 recently I was thinking about um, Solomon, how he approached King Solomon, David's son, how he approached the kingship that God had given him. King David, one of the greatest kings uh, in, in Israel, his son Solomon ascended to the throne. And when Solomon received the throne, he didn't just say, well, let me just do it how David did it. What he did was God came to him in a dream and the Lord said, well, ask me what you will. And he asked God for wisdom and an understanding heart to lead his people. What Solomon understood at that time was that I cannot do this without you. There is no me without you. These are your people. See, we're talking about strategy. And the first yes. thing he did was he went to prayer and he went mm -hmm. to God to ask God for a strategy to lead his people. He asked him for an understanding heart. So you asked me about how can women be more strategic? Yes. I can start with prayer. Okay. Because there is something that you cannot get in and of yourself that can only come from God. He can download and deposit into your spirit, into your mind, into your soul, into your being a strategy that is not written in books. That is not something that your predecessors did. You need a fresh irrigation from God, the mind of Going God. Back to that is, inner space within. That space within. So prayer. Yes. yes. Secondly, I think that when you approach um, 
leadership from a place of humility, that you don't know everything not a place of pride, not a place of title, but that you don't know everything, um, then you will invite people in. In a multitude of counselors, they're safety. So how can you be more strategic? Bring yes. in counselors, bring in people who are not only um, advanced and good at where you're going, but who also are people that can pray and people who are wise, people who are resourceful, people who are creative. Mm. Uh, Dr. Joyce and myself have been in the creative arts. Some of the most innovations have been made by creativity. So surround yourself with people. Iron yeah. sharp is iron. The only thing that can cut a diamond wow. is another diamond. Wow. Surround yourself with people. Learn from others. Humility. Ask. Ask. Go back to that inner space. Prior. Professor Joyce, how can women be more strategic in owning their futures? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, say something that uh, all the God people should forgive me because you, um, you are forgiven by all the God <laughs> prayer, people. Prayer is good, but the things of religion can also, um, can also trap us. Yes. Okay. If you yes. don't understand them because the same God that some pray to, they allow that same God to shackle them. You mm. see that. You see the, the thing about that book called the Bible is that there are different parts there. There are parts that you can read, and you are you can enrich yourself. And then there are other parts that, if you read and don't read rightly, can limit you. Yes. You know. So you know, some praying women would pray and wake up and tell you that no, God will give it to me. If it is mine, it will come to me. They're waiting for their for their bosses Faith to come to them. Without words, is dead. Yes, Tell because it has to be sir. revealed in a miracle. Some 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 prophet has to prophesy it to bring it to being. So that's when uh, religion and uh, maybe Bible people not understanding it becoming a shackle. A shackle, and, yes. and, and that is why if you notice even within the African American tradition, the the the. the you, you have the, the, the elderly people who where religion was key. And it's okay when you see the younger people say, don't give, give me that crap about religion. God didn't do anything. I'm the one busting my butt to work, well, you know, and stuff. It's because we have to be careful with that book because oh, yes. it could be empowering, but it has also limited our women because they get an image from there. You know, you know Professor, um, um, uh, being a person of faith myself, yes. um, actually yesterday I was having that conversation with my husband. I was listening to this major, major, major um, figure in, in Christianity. He was talking about his health, mm -hmm. how his health was going down. He was gaining weight and he was dying. He was literally dying. He said nobody knew. It was just his wife that knew about it. Hey, but he had to now take responsibility and start eating right, exercising. Now he looks really good. He has lost a lot of um, shit, a lot of whatever was bothering his body. So he's, he was talking about how if people don't understand the message of faith, it becomes a problem. This is a faith ministry. This is a faith ministry. So I was yes. telling my husband, I said, we need people like him to say more of these things because the messages some of us have preached have become the stumbling block in people's yes. eyes, not because yes. God is the problem, because people's interpretations of the message uh, was was not was not balanced, was not uh, in a way that people could receive it in empowering ways. And we are not going to delve more into that because we yeah. know that some of the motives for why some people do some of those things, uh, we don't want to have that a structure yeah. conversation. So, 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 Professor, we are talking about. Um, how, yeah, to how, how to start how women can start yeah, strategize yeah. and, and so i want to go to foundation. that yes i want to go to that spiritual it is key the what i just want to make sure is that let us not mistake it for a particular faith a particular uh religion um you women are spiritual beings yes. when uh, rashida keeps going to the beginning if you go to the beginning of the bible or you've been looking in our our physical self Every, I always say that every woman with a womb is a God. We are spiritual mm -hmm. beings. And so you, you need to connect with that space. You, you need to be able to, to come to that self to say, who am I? What yes. am I doing here? Yes. Well, what is my purpose? Yes. 
Yeah. What, what is it about me that I am supposed to live on this earth? Yes. What, 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 what is it? And, and sometimes we, we, you don't have to go too far. Start where you are. Are you satisfied? Are you, are you, you being know, I, was, I was I was reading Miles Monroe's work uh, of Blessed Memory, and he said, "God hid your destiny in a place that you can't miss it within you." Correct. Are you are you, are you, are you your authentic self? Yeah. Uh, you know, and then you start strategizing, uh, strategizing from there. There's something that we were told. My father told me, and I know many fathers, especially in Africa, told their daughters: education is your key. Education remains our key. It remains our key. You need to be, you, you need to be informed. Education is good for women, not just because it gives you a source of income, but it empowers you. You're able to learn how to learn. Okay. Until you are effectively educated that you can learn how to learn because information changes, your needs change. Mm. And mm. in order to keep walking in order to be current, in order to be able to meet any information gap, any gap, you need to have that ability to learn how to learn. Wow. Wow. And Once you have that ability, you can strategize change. any day, any time. Then I can go look for books by Rashida because I know that if I read those books, she has taken the time to put it in one place so I could learn from it. Wow. But if you have not learned how to learn, you cannot even go in search of information to fill a gap. Wow. You keep, there's a way in which you may start thinking, oh, okay, like me, I have a PhD, so I'm done. I've reached the pinnacle. Hell freaking no. <laughs> a PhD is in one little small area that you wrote a dissertation on. There's the rest of life that you don't have. Right, right, right. So we are looking at ensuring that um, you're, you're strategic with how you learn. Yes. Learn, learn how to learn. Education changes. Uh, you said information changes and our needs change. So we have to know how to to learn, learn how to learn. Um, I'm coming and I'm coming to you, Rashida. How can we be authentic in our leadership as women? Oh, that's a great question. Authenticity um, is a value that you have to decide to be a part of your life. Um, authenticity is, I often think of the difference between transparency and being translucent, right? Transparency, you can see through, but translucent, you'll run into pockets and shadows. Okay. So when you make the decision to be authentic in your leadership, that means that you are fully aware and you embrace and you understand your strengths, your weaknesses, mm -hmm. your failures, your losses, your mistakes, your, um, your, your, insecurities, you have a full awareness of that within you. So therefore you can sit into a space with other women understanding that they also share the same strength, weaknesses, you know, challenges and insecurities. Um, we can become more authentic when we're honest with ourselves. I think if you want real help, you have to be real with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself. I think you have to be honest with other people. There's a colloquialism where I grew up in Chicago on the West side and all over. They say that real recognizes real. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is true that real people who are authentic recognize other genuine and authentic people. And guess what? Fake people also recognize real people too. So a lot of times they don't want to invite you into circles because you will challenge their, um, th th their fakeness. OK, so when you decide to be an authentic person and be honest with yourself and sit with people and be honest with people and be teachable and learn from other people, I think that that will not only show out through your leadership, it'll show up and build relationships from your friendships to your families, to your marriages and to any other relationship that you touch. Thank you so much. How can we be authentic in our leadership, Professor Joyce? central to being authentic is building trust. Ooh. It's, it's building trust. And trust means that you have to deal with people and present yourself as a human being. A human being doesn't know it all. A human being needs others. And once a human being sacrifices for others, 
And so once you do that and you can get trust, then you are believable. Uh, the other day I went on Facebook. It's been, as we all know, difficult, challenging two years. And I came to a point that I had to accept to myself that I needed help. I want to relax. And we had spring break and it was like day three of spring break. I have uh, a few more days to go and my spirit is so tired and overwhelmed. So I went to Facebook. I'm like, can you guys, I need help. Somebody tell me what I can do to, to refresh my soul by Tuesday. This was Thursday. And people came and wrote, go to the spa, uh, see the sunrise, see that. My dean is my friend on Facebook. And my dean came on, on, on that post and said, uh, take a day at the spa, put it on professional development. Immediately I read that, I believed him. I didn't think he was joking. I knew he was serious. Some people may have thought, oh, your dean is joking with you. No, because he has built trust. Because I know he cares about me. Because I know that he wants me to be my best. And I am crying in public that I need help. And he knows that if I am not refreshed, he is going to be seeing one <laughs> tired professor dealing with his students. Wow. And he built that trust because he had sacrificed for me. He has done other things for me. He has, he has led in a way that I know that he would not come to, to, to look good in public. Mm. So it's, it it's, mean. it's not about what we try to do in public. It's in public. about who we are in, in truth, in, in public and in secret. And, and you, you, both of you, you both talked about trust a lot. So um, to, to lead in an authentic way, we have to be able to be transparent with others and be who we are and, and let others know who we are as people. Uh, Professor Joyce, you, you were just being a person and yes. you came to Facebook and you say, hey, it's not about prof right now. It's me, person needing help. And you were just being transparent out there. And I'm also looking at how we can build that trust apart from being transparent and being open because sometimes we we want to um ascend in ranks maybe in our professional life in our careers we we you know in our businesses how do we build that trust in spheres like in business with clients with uh with colleagues Yes. How do we really build that trust, Rashida? Yeah, I think trust is something that uh, it is earned. It's a cliche, but it's also truth. Trust is earned. You don't really just walk into the door trusting someone. You have to spend that time in that relationship with them. Like Dr. Joy said, her dean, they have a level of trust because that was built and that was earned. Okay, so how do we build trust with people? The, the first thing is it starts with you deciding to become a trustworthy person. Can you be trusted? If you're not a trustworthy person, you cannot extend what you don't have. And then are you asking someone to trust you with something that you haven't proven to them that you are equipped or able to carry? See, I think sometimes we demand stuff from people that we don't give to other people. And so when we are building trust with someone, we're coming to them. I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm really saying I'm going to earn your trust. And the way that I earn your trust is by um, being full of integrity in my actions, yes. in my character, yes. in my words, where my word is my bond and my deeds. I, you, can, you can watch my actions and my deeds. And then I'll let you decide if you can trust me. And when you do have that trust with someone, it's critical to not violate that trust. You don't understand that one wrong thing can viol violate and do away with years of what you built. The word of God says that a good name is to be desired above riches. And I know we mentioned earlier about religion, and this is where people get caught up. And I do agree with you that people get caught up in religion because as it's 8 billion people, there can be 8 billion religions. If I want to worship a tree, I guess I can call that my religion and I can go and worship a tree. But when I'm talking about the word of God, I'm not talking about religion. 
I'm talking about relationship. Mm. And when you can move from religion to relationship, then as a spiritual woman, you can understand who you are. And so I just mm. wanted to touch upon that because how do we build trust? I always come back to, I cannot build trust if I have not learned to trust. Okay. And I trust God when I cannot trust man because he won't let me down. He's never failed me. Man has, religion has, shackles have. But if I have not been um, a person who can trust someone, I cannot be a person who is trustworthy. So how do we do it? We find people we can trust and we become people who are trustworthy. Wow. And integrity and character. And we should give time. Professor wants to say something. Yes. Yes. I And I want to address this to the parents who are watching because um, that is where it begins. You know, this we're talking about leadership. It starts from the home. This trust we are talking, this integrity, you know, uh, as, uh, as kids, the times when uh, something is missing or somebody has broken a glass and they come, who has broken this glass and stuff and all that. And, and then a parent will say, just tell me, I'll not do anything. And then the child says that it's me. And then you go ahead and beat them. They, then they're not going to say the truth the next time. They're not yes. going to say the truth the next time, yes. you know? So this integrity being, uh, um, being open, but also, also being doing things the way you expect them to be done, right. you know, doing things the way you expect them to be done. And, you know, when we're talking about uh, being authentic selves, it's very uh, easy, you know, a uh, cliche, authentic self. It is difficult to be the authentic self because we live in a world of facade. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to keep projecting who we are not. It is sometimes very difficult to project who we are because of the image we have of perfection. Mm -hmm. And you can, we, that if that authentic self is not what is real, so that's why people will say they know things that they don't know and fumble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you come to your workspace. Uh, could you tell us about this? And then you start, you know that you don't know. Instead of saying, can I take a day or two to prepare? And 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 we know that that wouldn't last. That wouldn't last because no, it would, it would, it we, are, we are we are looking at building to last. And if, if we want to be authentic, it's about acknowledging our weaknesses as well, and knowing that nobody's perfect, and we can actually learn and grow from the places of our weaknesses. So yeah. so that's that's what we are saying Susan, here. Susan, let me let me just say something here. I know somebody's uh, writing here about vulnerability, and I want to tell a, a story how that helped me as um, growing up. My dad used to, God bless his soul, used to bring his pay slip to show us. It's like, this is how much I am earning. When I, he was paying, at the time he had taken a car loan. He says they're taking part of my money for car loan. He showed us. By the time he was done, I didn't understand where money was coming from to, to send us to school. So I would tell him, I said, Papa, uh, don't give me now. I can, it's it's okay. I can go to school. You can send me money later. And he would be the one begging me to say, no, it's not that bad. But that's because he allowed himself to appear broke in front of, in front of us. But uh, some parents, they want to appear like superheroes. So you're hiding the truth from the children. And that's how the children don't, uh, uh, don't know. You know, and that is why sometimes people wonder why single parents, especially single mothers, are so successful with some of their children. You know why? Because take the father out, there's a very close relationship, and the children know firsthand how hard their mother is trying, and they're able to work together. Go ask Obama. Go ask Bill Clinton. They'll tell you that. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. For, uh, listening to us, I'm, I'm just like, wow. This cuts across to the family, to the business places, to meeting strangers on the street. And it's, it's life. It's, it's life. It's either we are doing life or we are not doing life. It's either we are leading in an authentic way or we are not leading in an authentic way. And today we are talking women, leadership, and success. The question that comes to my mind is, um, 
to be able to be where you are doing what you're doing, adding value, because leadership is all about adding value to others. It's about bringing people from where they are to and helping them to find where they want to be and helping them to be on that track to where they actually want to be. That's leadership. So being in the front and leading, that's what you are doing, Rashida. That is what you are doing, Professor Joyce. What experiences have helped you believe more in your ability to make a difference what experiences have helped you to believe more in your ability to make a difference in the lives of others? Because we might have a woman that's watching right now and she's like, I don't really know who I am. I don't know if I can make an impact. And you, you've been telling us that from the cradle to the boardrooms to um, offices, it's, it's, it's either we are leading or we are not. And you told us, Professor Joyce, about your father and your sister. And, and, and it's all leadership in those places that people don't even see. But what are those experiences, Rashida, that have made you believe in your ability to make a difference? Um, wow. First, um, it was my father as well. I was raised by my father and uh, my mother, my parents divorced when I was eight and I went to live with my father when I was 12. And so I, my father had full custody. So I was the child that went to visit her mother every two weeks. So my life was a little bit different. It kind of was a life that was similar to not your norm. And my father put the belief in me. He spent the time. He taught me about leadership and motivation. He put the first books in my hand. I watched him build his business from scratch. I watched him sacrifice. I watched us uh, have nothing, but I was able to go to one of the best schools in, in Illinois and become senior class president in an all white school first in the history of the school. So I had a lot of experiences in my younger years that built my self-esteem and my ability to believe in myself. Well, in my adulthood life, it was my, it was actually my failures and it was my losses because those were the places that I came into contact with me. The part of me that I didn't think uh, that could be there, the person who went through divorce and bankruptcy, the person who went through losses and, and, and just entered into things where you're like, how did I get here? I was introduced to me. I was also introduced in those dark moments to God. And then I was able to see that he is greater than me and he brought me through things. So what happened for me is that those dark places and those failures has sharpened my ability to relate and connect to people in their pain, in their grief, in their losses. My brother and sister were murdered violently in 2017 and 2018. I suffered a miscarriage in 2019. I've stood at more podiums and um, churches to do eulogies of people that I respected. I've walked with the greats and then I've talked and walked with the lows. That has actually framed my perspective to be able to give me the experiences I need to be me. For a while, I was trying to emulate people I looked up to. <laughs> and I, and I, you, you're taught to do that, right? So, you know, make it till you make it. And you're not even trying to be phony. You're really just trying to just grow up. But then when I realized that every door that was closed, closed doors are an answer to prayer too. I thank God for doors. He did not open for me to pray to get in, to sit at tables so that he could show me the table he's spreading before me. So in my dark places, in my low places, that's how I was able to come into identity with, wait a minute, I got a gift where not only I can connect to people, my heart is compassionate for people who are broken and lost and hurting, who not only do not know themselves and what they're supposed to do and their purpose, I can't give you your purpose. I don't. I didn't make you. And the problem that we have is that we sit here in front of a camera and we pretend to be what we're not. I am not God and I'm not your God. I did not make you. I did not create you. I do not know your past from your present to your future. What I can do, which is what I do good and, and I'm good at it, is I can encourage you. Yes. I can come alongside you. I can give you hope. I can irrigate you. I can push you. I can challenge you. And I can, and, and I can water to make you believe that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's what I'm called to do. And that's what took me all these years and all these tears to figure out 
and I won't let nobody take it from me. And I will not try to imitate anybody else. And I believe I can sit in any room with the best of the best, degreed or not. And I could sit in my skin and I could be who God called me to be. And you'll walk away better. Oh, wow. Being with me. And I'm pretty sure in humility, I'll walk away better being with you. Wow. 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 When when you come to that being, to that place, then you know. Wow. wow. You've arrived till you meet your maker. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Listen, if you're watching us, I want you to put in the comments. Hashtag go back home and lead. So the if risk, I could, I'm, uh, coming, I'm coming to you, Professor. Yes. I'm coming because we are in the last hours, the last <laughs> minutes um, of, of, of our broadcast. If you're watching us, I want you to go in the comments and put hashtag go back home and lead. You might just be a sister. Get up in the morning and look at your f- siblings' faces. Are they smiling? What do they need for you to, for their days to be better? What can you do? Lead from the front. You don't need anybody's permission to be kind. You don't need anybody's permission to look out for another person. And when we start imbibing those values and those attitudes from, from a young age, like Professor Joyce, it becomes part of your life. And you want to lead in the front and not wait for people to give you permission because you're called to that. There is a gift in you. You're not born to die with it like Rashida. Go back home and lead. Put that in the comments for us, please. If you're watching right now, hashtag go back home and lead. There is so much value in you. You don't need permission to let it out. Professor Joyce, I was looking at the experiences that have molded you. We are in the last minutes of our conversation. I've already shared um, a a few. I was fortunate to grow up with seven leaders, my mom and dad, who who were authentic. My mom was so authentic that she was an African, you know. I I grew up with uh, a feminist without the label. You know, so she made me realize that I was coming to a world where women have to fight to be heard. If when my mother comes from work with my dad, they come in the same car and they enter the house. My father would turn to my mom and say, what's for dinner? And she would scream at the top of her voice. Can you see this? We come into the same house and he's asking me for food. My daughter, let me tell you, it doesn't matter whether you learn or you don't learn. You will deal with things like this. You would deal with things, things like that. And then when I used to argue with my mother and I'm finding my space, you know what she would tell me? She said, if you knew you were coming to this world to argue like that, you should have brought a penis. Because with, without that, you can talk like this. But maybe the world will be different for you when you, when, when you, uh, when you grow up. So I became very aware okay. of the challenges that women have to be heard, Mm. you know? And so in just saying those things, she empowered me. She made me realize that it wasn't that uh, easy. And then another thing that she used to do during the summer holiday, she would decide that her older girls cook. So when I got to a certain age, I am the one who had the food money. And I remember at the time it was like 40,000 for a month. And then when I use it, you know, young girl, the first few few days I'm making fish, uh, meat, I'm not planning. Then the last two weeks, it's getting really tight and she will start laughing. She was like, you know, if that money was with me, I'll be adding my own money, uh, extra money, and your father will not be aware that I'm adding money. Now it's with your hand. Look at how much is left. That can fit us, you know. We need more, you know, it's like, but your father does not know that if I, if I have the money. So just in little spaces like that, I was aware of womanhood. And then of course, my father drummed up the education. This is what my father told me and which I want every young girl or parent who is listening to tell your girl, my father told me, he says, I want you to be educated so that you can be able to take care of yourself. I want you to sleep with a man when that time comes, because you feel like it, not for food, not for shelter, not for clothing, 
just because you feel like it. Mm. Because God has made it that a man and woman should mm. go together. Mm. And so those, that, that is a kind of empowering space that I grew up, uh, up right. with. But right. guess what? I took it for granted. I mm. thought every home was like that. My parents died tragically in a car accident when I was 20. I lost oh. both of them. Wow. And before that, my immediate sister had drowned. Oh. So I had known tragedy, which also made me to realize that life is fragile. Mm. And when you know that life is fragile, you don't have time to waste. Oh, yeah. You don't have time to waste. The urgency, the urgency. The urgency. Because it's you know that every never. day could be the last. Because this were healthy, happening human beings. One fine day, I don't have a home. Right. And so that living life, you know, mm. just embracing life, knowing that it could uh, it could end. But right. over the years, when I now realized that what I knew, my value systems were not common, not every child grew up like that, I became right. intentional. More intentional. I now realize that what I have is something that I could impact others. Right, right. You know, right. and you see, you come to that space yeah. until you come to that space. And Rashida got to that space where you have to impact others. Yes. You yes. realize that it's not enough for you. Mm. And you you just you just give that help. You just it, it just comes naturally. You right. just right. so I reached that space. And I have become intentional with what I do. You know, people reach out to me for uh, yeah. advice. They reach you know, out to me. Professor, I was, about, I was about to get there because we are in the last minutes of our conversation. Uh, I was like um, thinking there might be a woman watching or even a man watching us right now. And what would be? your words what would be your message to them if you were to tell them your final words in this session for today what would you tell them i would tell them be intentional about living life is for living life is for leading be intentional about it and Nothing is small. Of recent, based on some of the advice, I, I suggestions I had on Facebook, I've started being intentional about chasing sunrise and sunset. If I miss the sunrise, I try to catch the sunset, just watching the sun drop. Be intentional. I dance. I get up and dance to good music and enjoy myself. I'm intentional about helping others. You know, so that would be my message. Life is for living. Live while you are alive. Stop planning for that perfect day. Stop planning that you have to be, have all this knowledge before you can help somebody. You have all this money before you can help somebody. There's somebody there who needs something you already have, a word you already know. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is Professor Joyce Ashu Ntang with us. And Rashida, I hate it. This is my worst time of the show. <laughs> Always, it's like I don't change. <laughs> Always my worst time, but we have to be respectful of your time. What would be your last words? My last words would be that God loves you. As I'm listening to Dr. Joyce and Susan, I'm sitting here inundated with the love for you that I feel from him, that God loves you. And I want you to know that what he put inside of you is more than you can ever imagine or think. Don't be afraid to do the impossible, to do the unthinkable, whether you're a man or a woman. Forgive yourself, ask for forgiveness and forgive others. Receive grace. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve and give mercy. And I also want to apologize to whatever has happened to you in your life. I'm sorry that that has happened to you. The grief, the tragedy, the loss, the pain, the violation, the inequality, the injustice. But I don't want you to think that those things will hinder you. Take them 
and go help someone else through them. You experience them and you're intimate with them so that you can go and invest and mentor in someone else and help someone else through that. So I would leave you with my final words, which are his final words to me, that God loves you and he's more for you than the world against you. Be encouraged no matter what you face, no matter where you are. You are loved, you are needed, and we need you. So go be, be you. We need you, be you. Be we you. need you, be you. That would be, be our you. final words to you. If you want to put it in the hashtag, do that. And that would be our closing comments for you. We need you, be you. You might want to go back and listen to this. Hey, do that. We love you. See you at the top. It's been Professor Joyce and Rashida with us talking women, leadership, and success. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank I learned you. so much. Love you guys. God bless you. And we'll you. see you next time. For your corporate and personal needs. Ladies World Institute. Changing lives. One leader at a time.